This meeting is being recorded. Ya se está grabando. Okay, I'm going to try something. Let me move it from here. Can you grab it? Okay. 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 I'm going to try putting it here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hilton, ¿y ahora? Eh, ahora, bueno, sí, te, te oigo. Okay, so okay. No pressure. <laughs> so this presentation, like you see, it's going to be on neural networks. We're going to talk a little bit about the biological foundation of neural networks. And we're also going to explain this from a level where we're not assuming a lot of previous background. So ideally, this is a great introduction if you've never seen a neural network or have no idea what a neural network is or haven't seen the prerequisite math, hopefully we'll cover it. So if you don't understand anything whatsoever, please ask because it's very important that you try to get as much out of this as you can. So hopefully this can be like a longer series on deep learning or machine learning methods that we could use in the project. Yeah. So. No sé. Fernando está conectado. No. We're recording. Uh, unless otherwise stated, most of the information here is from this book and specifically this chapter. I use a few other resources and they'll be linked uh, at the end. So just a bit of background that you might need to try to, as a prerequisite to understand this. Very basic level. What is a function? If you've taken a pre-calculus class and you've already seen this, the most important feature of functions is that they map one element from the domain to an element from the range. And no element in the domain can be mapped to more than one element. So with that in mind, is, is the square root of x a function? No, it's not a function because it has negative and positive values. So that's something to consider. The first thing that we're going to do here is try to create a neural network that models some very simple functions. Um, so first, we need to know about Boolean functions. If you've heard of this, uh, you can think of zeros and ones, true and false values. And we're going to try to develop some functions from the sets of true and false values. So first off, uh, Boolean values can be of any finite arity. What that means is just that the inputs that they take in are finite. Okay? So for example, a zero area function, for example, true doesn't require any inputs, it's just true, whereas not needs something to negate. Um, we'll, we'll give an example of this later on. And and requires two uh, inputs, it's binary, because you need something and something else to compare together, yeah? And the domain of this function is gonna be all the possible sets of true and false values. So that's gonna be false, 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 true, true, false and false, uh, yeah, true, true. Those are the four possible combinations. And that's what you see here. We have the four combinations of true and false values for A and B. And then when we use the and operator on A and B, we only get a one. By the way, in the presentation, we're gonna use ones to represent true and zero to represent false. This is pretty standard in computer science, so I just wanted to mention that. A and B is only true when both A and B are true. A or B is true whenever A or B is true. This is kind of the classical interpretation of or that everyone has. Whereas exclusive or, which is what SOAR means, is a bit more confusing. It's only true when either A or exclusively A or exclusively B is true. It is not true when both A and B are true. And it is not true when both A and B are false. Otherwise, it's true. Does that make sense? Gotta love that. <laughs> I got it. Cool. Yeah. So, oh no, that I mean that natural language, uh, natural language disjunction, the the or or or, uh, sometimes behaves as the or, and sometimes behaves as as the exclusive or, and we switch from one to the other all the time, but we don't realize it. 
Yeah. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I made the comment. Um, and what, what this means down here, this disjunctive normal form, it's nothing too complicated. What it means is that any Boolean function can be represented using these three, um, these three operators. However complicated it may be, we can represent it using and, or, and XOR. So moving on to the biological representation of neurons, um, or I'm just gonna mention some features of connectionist networks first. Uh, so connectionist networks, they exploit parallel processing. They don't feature explicit rules, which means that we're never gonna tell a connectionist network, otherwise known as a neural network, explicitly what to do. We're gonna try to get it to learn. Uh, I, I put that bolded in quotes because they don't really learn. Um, we'll see kind of what that means later. Uh, we're going to study single and multi-layered perceptrons, which are pretty much the most basic forms of, I guess, predictive models we can use. Um, they're pretty old. These are from like the 1970s, and we have much better technology now. But explaining these will help you really understand the, the more modern technology. Moving on to the illustration for a typical neuron, there's a few things going on here. So there's an axon that... That is where electrical messages go from one neuron to the other. The, specifically, the messages sent through the axon go to the dendrites. They receive synaptic inputs. And if the total sum of the inputs that a dendrite is receiving is greater than the threshold for that neuron, then the neuron will fire and do whatever it does. There's no real standard for what a neuron does. They're extremely complicated. They have a lot of, fu a lot of functions in the brain. And it's not at all like what we're gonna represent. Our, our neural networks that we're gonna build are very homogeneous, meaning that they pretty much do the exact same thing when we talk about them firing. And their uh, synapse connects axons from one neuron to the, den to the dendrites of another neuron. So you can think of that as just the connections between uh, the axons and dendrites of neurons, right? So they're kind of the connections between them. We're gonna see that some of these neurons are inhibitory and some of these neurons are excitatory, which just means that they either inhibit or they try to excite more neuron activations. And we're gonna see how we try to model that in our you know, neural network representation. Why are we doing this? I think it's very clear to everyone in this room that this is a five, this is a seven, and this is an eight. I guess this is, Possibly, arguably a one. I don't know. Or a Z. Or, or a Z. But if they're numbers, we we can come we can realize pretty quickly what they are. Whereas for a computer, this is pretty much an impossible task. Um, if you just tried to code a function that would understand this, um, especially if you wanted a generalizable model that could work for ten thousand examples of handwritten digits. So this is like machine learning one hundred and one. Basically, this is from the MNIST database. Uh, which just was a compilation uh, that was done by Yen De Kuhn and some other researchers that were trying to understand how to learn a representation for these uh, uh, numbers specifically and make a classification model to be able to identify them correctly. Um, so we're, we're, later on, we're going to see a little bit about how we can maybe start building something like this that can identify the, the numbers correctly. So first off, very basic, the artificial neuron. First off, does everyone understand what everything here means? So this sigma is just the sum. So it's the sum from I to N of the different weights and inputs that come into this neuron. So like we previously mentioned, there are electrical messages that go to other neurons from the axons. So you can kind of think of this input as an electrical signal that's going into a neuron. And the weight, you can think of it as the synapse that's between the dendrite and the axon of a, of a neuron, right? So it's, it's the connection between the input and the summation of the inputs. And that weight is going to have a value associated with it. Some literature says this value is usually between negative one and one, but really you can have any value for this weight. And what, what the weight is gonna do, it's either gonna amplify the input that's coming in or the signal, or it's gonna inhibit the signal if it's a value less than one, which is pretty clear, I think. So when all said and done, and we've received all the inputs, multiplied them by all the weights, we add that number together, and that is the total input that's going into the neuron. So 
for, for a real neuron, this would just be the total electrical signals that it's receiving. Now, if that input is greater than the threshold for activating that neuron, it will fire. And it will fire an output S. And we, we haven't really seen what this output of the neuron looks like or what it does, but we're gonna try to show um, exactly what it looks like with activation functions. So these are certain, so when, when we do meet this threshold and we send out a signal, usually we want that signal to be between zero and one. So what we'll use is the sigmoid function. Um, and the sigmoid function is just one over one plus e to the negative x. And that is always going to be a value between zero and one. I don't think it actually ever reaches zero or one, but it gets very close to it. And that's just gonna make sure that we stay between zero and one. And why do we want that? If we go back to the Boolean algebra, we know that off is zero and we know that on is one. So we kind of have like a range between off and on that we can kind of play around with. So we, we like that. There's other types of activation functions depending on what you're trying to do with your network. For example, the linear function is just a straight line the more input you have, the more signal output you're gonna send out. It's a direct relation. There's a threshold linear, which is exactly the same thing, just that up to a certain input, you're gonna output a signal of zero until the input reaches a value such that it, it meets this threshold, and then you'll have a linear relation. So maybe from zero to three, this will output a zero, but once it reaches three, it'll have a linear relation with the, with the output. Um, then there's also the binary threshold. So this would literally just be a value between zero and one. So let's say if the signal we're receiving is a 0 0.5, we're not gonna do anything, but, or sorry, if it's a 0 0.4, we're not gonna do anything, but once it reaches 0 0.5, it's gonna be a one. And for any input greater than 0 0.5, it's still gonna be a one. And there are some nonlinear functions that are very useful that we won't really get into right now because they're a little bit more complicated. They introduce some stochastic processes into um, these functions. That's a bit too complicated for now, so maybe we'll mention them later. So the, the principal differences between single and multi-layered networks, first off, are the learning rules. The learning rules that we're going to use for single-layer networks do not work for multi-layer networks and vice versa. And multi-layer networks have something called hidden units. We saw a single-layer network here that just has a single layer of inputs and, a, and an output. Whereas we're gonna see with the multi-layered uh, neural networks, we have a layer of inputs and then however many layers in between that are going to do some things. For now, they'll just be mysterious and we'll explain them later, yeah. Um, the condition X is greater than T is the condition for that summation value, so X to be used in the activation. So that, that condition is what that's sentence. yeah if for example if the total input if we're using a linear activation function and let's say our threshold is 40 and we have an input of 50 then our our signal output would be uh, 50 because there's a direct linear relation right that the the total input that's being sent out whereas with a sigmoid it doesn't really matter what it is. It's always going to be a value between zero and one. Does that make sense? What determines whether the value is, you know, 0.5 or, or is that weighted in some way? Okay. Okay. So, do you mean x? No, because you mentioned it. It doesn't necessarily. It's not necessarily going to be 0.5. It could be some value between zero and one. Okay. It depends on the inputs that we receive. So we'll do an example real quick. So let's say, imagine a neuron like. Something like this. Okay. We have an x is greater than t, i1, i2, w1, w2. If i1 is equal to 1 and i2 is equal to 1, and let's say weight 1 is equal to 2 and weight 2 is equal to 3. So the sum, right, x is going to be equal to the sum of i1 which is one times the weight one, which is two plus I two, sorry, I two, which is one times three, which is the second weight. So 
x is just going to be equal to five. And let's say our threshold is four. Since five is greater than four, then five. our neuron is going to fire. And if we have a linear relation with the output, then we're just going to output a five. If we had a sigmoid, well, you plug five into here, okay. and that's what S would be. Okay. Well, that makes sense. All right. So does it have anything to do with Bayes theorem or probability? Not right now. Yeah, right works. now, this this neural network is just it's it's literally a function. Okay. Right? Like it has an input and an output, and there's no nothing stochastic going on. But if for example we were using uh Jalu, for example. ELU, the, that activation function uses uh, the standard normal distribution for this data set in its output. So you would introduce some probability there. But right now we're, we're not doing that. You know, when you say, when you say stochastic, do you mean like, like a random Probability, value? yeah, like a random value. Yeah, I, I, don't, I haven't seen stochastic proxies yet. I don't know what's that stochastic. Yes, stochastic just means uh, that we're introducing some kind of probability into the mix, whatever that might be or wherever that might be. In this case, it would be in the activation function. So we mentioned that uh, the learning rules are going to be different for, for single and multi-layered networks. And we mentioned that multi-layered networks are going to have hidden units that we don't understand right now, but we'll understand later. So getting, in, getting on to single layer networks. This is a neural network that represents the not function that is only going to take as an input zeros and ones. If there's an input that isn't a zero or a one, it's going to totally ignore it. So if this is a one, it well, how does the not function work first off, right? Uh, if the not, oh, I actually don't have it here. <laughs> That's funny. Um, if we have an input of one for not, we're supposed to get a zero. And if you get an input of zero for not, then we're supposed to get a one as the output. That's just how the not function works. Inverse. Yeah, inverse. Yeah. So if, if we get a true value, we, we get a false value. If we get a false value, we get a true value. So this is the yes is no, no is yes. It's the negation of it's the negation of the input. Okay. Yeah, and then you can change that with like and like this is true and, and this is not true. You can like make a function. What's what's the what's the what's the use in that? Why can't you just use one and zero as they are? Like, what do you mean? Why would you do? Why would you inverse that? Why would you invert that? Um, yeah. So really, like what Carlos mentioned, these are logic. These are logic gates. So they're used a lot in circuits. Okay. So maybe your circuit receives an input of one, uh -huh. but you don't want that to be a one. You only want it to activate it when it's a not. Oh. When it's when it's uh, zero, right? So you just make, you can negate it. There's there's a lot of applications. Okay, really. I see yeah. that. Okay, so kind of like if you want a pilot light to turn on when there's no power. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's exactly right. Not power. If not power, show you that Luna's down. down. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a not network. Let's say our input is a zero. If our input is a zero, we're going to multiply it by negative one, which is zero. And x, the total sum of inputs, is equal to zero, which luckily enough is our threshold, which means we're going to fire. In, in other words, let's say we're using the sigmoid function here, we would send out a one. Okay. And if we received the one, we would multiply the one by negative one, and we would see that negative one is less than zero, so, the near, so we won't activate, we'll send out a zero. Okay. Interesting. So this is how not works. How would and work? Does anyone have any ideas? I don't it would have two conditions on the team. So like this, you mean? Yeah. And then this would be the, the sum. This would be x. Yeah. And then the t there would be like yeah. it could be like zero and one or something. Okay, so you're saying t is equal to what? It could do zero. It could fire with zero or one. Right. So x could be so do you want? I, I, I'm just guessing. Yeah, let's say 
What if, what if he is equal to three? What, what would you do for the input of this is for an AND network? Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you do two, then you, okay. Yeah, so what do we need here to, for this to be greater than or equal to two? Would you need that? Oh, no. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I won. I feel like I'm on value spar than a fifth grader. It's scary. <laughs> That'll work. I like them after. That's how I feel with this. I one equals I. So is that I or T? I one equals I two. Yeah, so I'm just saying that. I1 can be equal to I2, can be equal to W, can be equal to weight one, can be equal to weight two, if they're all equal to one, because we will only fire here when every everything is one. And if this one is zero, then we're gonna not fire. If this is zero, we're not gonna fire. And if both of these are zero, we're not gonna fire. So that works. Okay. And uh, that's what we have here. That's exactly what we have. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you think he's surprised, that's exactly what we have here. No, but like this doesn't need to be a two. This would be like four. This would be four point five. It could be anything. It'd be anything, and we can show with. I'm not going to show the theorem, but there's some really interesting results that show that these these neural networks converge to what problem they're going to solve if that problem is solvable, at least for the single. A uh, single uh, layer case. So that's what the learning means. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna try to. Yeah, learning is trying to converge on a solution. That's good intuition for what uh, learning is. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? What do you know? <laughs> we have we have yeah, yeah. So, single layer neural networks are implementations of symbolic systems. So what I mean by that is that we took, for example, this knot and we implemented it, and there's not as much stuff as we could do with them as with uh, multi-layered networks but things things like this we can do there's two types of learning there's supervised and unsupervised learning the supervised learning examples are like logistic regression linear regression if you haven't heard of a regression you're basically trying to plot a like, for example, trying to plot a line to some data. So let's say you have house prices. So you have the house prices in your x-axis and their location in the y-axis. So maybe when they're farther away from, I don't know, a very noisy area, they're more expensive. So you you kind of get a linear relation between the data and you can map it with linear regression. The trend line in Excel. Yeah, trend lines in Excel. Yeah, trend lines. Well, I can add on, like, I'm looking at some of this for that little. Um, you want to find if there's a relationship between two variables, and when you say linear, you want to find if that relationship is linear, but it could be like quadratic, like yeah. a couple already. Maybe. Yeah. But it's essentially regression is trying to find the best fit for this thing that you're getting. Is this the same kind of regression that's used in differential statistical modeling? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's unsupervised methods for figuring out your data as well. So clustering is just a method of let's say let's say you have a bunch of words, you can cluster them based on their spell checkers distance to each other. So like how much do I need to change this sentence such that it becomes this other sentence? And you can cluster them based on the least distance, for example, something like that. We don't really need to get into the details of these, but it's just good to know that they exist. So unsupervised learning. The simplest form, the simplest implementation of this is called heavy and learning. And it's based on the, I, I, I don't want to say famous, but the, the motto, I guess, that neurons that fire together, wire together. What that means is, I don't think this is proven at all, but like, you know, apparently if like neurons fire a lot, then they literally wire together, like they'll, they'll fire more. It kind of like encourages future behavior of firing again. Um, so, we try to do this using heavy and learning uh, according to this. So essentially, we try to change the weights of the function based on some epsilon, which is just our learning rate. Um, think of this as a value between 0 and 1. That's just how fast we're going to learn, how fast we're going to change these weights 
And we're going to change the weights based on the inputs that we receive. Um, we don't really need to get into it right now. We're going to see some more of the notation here. Delta X is just going to be the change in X. Or, and the other delta, that's the other delta, is going to be the error measure, which is just the intended output minus the actual output. So it's kind of like the error. And then epsilon is our learning rate constant. So when we want to train a model that isn't working, for example, maybe this and isn't working and we want to fix it, we would do this. So if it's not working, that means we either need to change the threshold or the weights, because the input is going to be the same. It's either going to be zero or one. We're not going to change that. So we're either going to change the threshold or the weight. And how we change that is we multiply our learning rate constant times delta, so the error measure, how bad the error was, and we're going to subtract that from uh, delta. So if this is the change in delta, then the new delta is, or sorry, the new threshold would be threshold plus the change in threshold, which is negative. So we would subtract from the threshold to get the new threshold. And the same thing with weights, just that it's inverse. So we add to the weights. Um, we can also subtract from the weights if one of these values is negative. But let's look at, uh, oh, we don't actually see that yet. Um, yeah, we don't need to see this. So this is supposed to be a not network. And we can kind of see that if we've got a zero here, zero is not greater than 0 0.2. So it's actually not going to fire when we need it to fire. So how can we fix it? We just use the per spectron convergence rule that we just mentioned. So the change in T is going to be equal to negative epsilon times the delta and the change in weight i. By the way, I didn't mention this. I should have done. This just means the the it, the it weight, right? So we have an input one and we have a weight one. We have an input two and we have a weight two. So that, that's what I means there. Uh, that's one times delta times I, I. So we know that this is going to work. So let's just apply what we know. Our error in this case is so the intended output should be a one when we input a zero, but we're actually getting a zero. So our delta is equal to one. That's the error we have. And let's just set our learning rate equal to 0 0.5, just to set some value. So we can calculate what we need to change in the threshold. So change in t is equal to negative 0 0.5 times, times what? And we can also calculate the change in a weight. So this is equal to 0 0.5 uh, times 1 times the input, which was 0. So the change in weight is 0. So we don't actually need to change the weight. And it makes a lot of sense, because if the input is 0, then no weight we put here is going to change the fact that this is 0. So there's actually no need to change the weight. So the, the weight is going to stay the same, but we can change the threshold. We see that. We can subtract 0 0.5 from our current threshold. So our new threshold is going to be equal to negative 0 0.3. And let's see if this works now. So when we input a 0, we see that a 0 is indeed greater than negative 0 0.3. So the neuron is going to fire. But now it might be too sensitive, so you might have to do this over and over. Well, let's see. If we input a 1, 1 times negative 0 0.6 is less than the threshold, so it's not going to fire. So that's good. We have a 0 when we want a 0, and we have a 1 when we want a 1. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. So this is the result that I mentioned previously. This rule that we just applied is always going to converge on a solution wherever there is a solution that is possible. Um, and what we mean by a solution is that we can generate a set of weights and a threshold, some combination of the two, that gives us the solution that we want, that can compute right, the, the Boolean functions that we're, that we're giving it. 
But this single layer perceptron angle doesn't always work. And when it doesn't work, is when we're dealing with functions that are not linearly separable. So we've already talked about functions. We're just adding linearly separable. What does that mean? It means literally that a function is linearly separable if you can draw a straight line between its outputs that are false and its outputs that are true. All right? For, for and, we can do that because if we plotted all the outputs here on this little plot, we can see all the false down here and just a single true value for n. So we can draw a line between them. However, we can't do that for exclusive or. There's no way to draw a line here such that we separate, uh, that we separate the true values from the false values. So that means that there's actually no way to represent an exclusive or using single layered networks. No, it doesn't matter. Well, it's a I mean, there. No, it doesn't matter. So this is the Zor function. Like we mentioned previously, it's going to be zero when both inputs are zero and zero when both inputs are true. And it's only going to be true when only one of the inputs is true. So we just discussed that it's not linearly separable because I just told you, but why is it not linearly separable? If you think about it for a second, we need this to be true when I2 is true. That means that I2 times weight 2 needs to be greater than or equal to the threshold. And we also need this to be true when I1 is true. So we need I1 times weight 1 to be more than the threshold. But now we've reached a contradiction because since I1 times W1 plus I2 times W2 is also greater than or equal to the threshold, then we have a contradiction here because we need this to be false and we don't have that. So this is how you can prove that some, some problem that you're trying to do isn't linearly separable. Try to reach a contradiction somehow. So we move on to multi-layer networks to try to represent this exclusive OR network. And what we come out to is just uh, a multi-layer network with only one hidden unit. And how this works is if we receive, if I1 is equal to one, then we're gonna add one to our threshold. Notice our threshold is one. So to pass this uh, hidden unit, you need to have a one here. Otherwise you won't pass. But we have a one, so we pass and we output a one. Now notice that if both of them are true, then we have a one, but we're also adding a negative one to the threshold. So we have a zero and zero is not greater than one. So we output a zero. So notice that this is only true when one of the inputs is true. Does that make sense? Does, does everyone believe me that this works? I believe you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, so multi-layer networks. It makes sense. Yeah. Can construct um, can be constructed such that they can compute any Turing computable function, but they cannot be trained using the perceptron convergence rule. It kind of makes sense because what we were doing earlier, it basically relied on the fact that inputs and weights were independent, but now they're actually not because every neuron receives input from all previous neurons, or you know, a neuron has inputs from all of its previous neurons. So it's not really independent anymore. We can't really do that. So that's kind of a problem. Um, we've explored feed forward neural networks. What that means is that we go from input to input to input in this order. You can think of it as a series of time steps. So think of it as for, for this network, it would be three time steps. We go to time step one, where we're just receiving input. Time step two, when we're sending that input to the hidden units. And time step three, when we're outputting. That, that's, that's what we call a feed forward neural network. So now the problem is, how do we train a multi-layer neural network? Back to the classifier example. Let's say we were trying to build um, a multi-layer neural network that was able to classify. Let's say we have 10 digits here. 
And say we have 10,000 samples of handwritten digits, all very well labeled. So we have the labels corresponding to each image that tells us if it's a five, if it's a four, if it's a whatever. And let's say these images are seven times seven pixels. So seven times seven pixels. So we have 49 pixels per image. So we're gonna have 49 input neurons. And what these neurons are gonna be, they're just gonna represent. Wow, I can see, okay. Well, high resolution image. Yeah, a high resolution image, this seven times seven pixels is a joke. Right, um, yeah. that's 49 neurons just for those 49 pixels. Yeah, you so can imagine like, something like that's like. Like a 1080 image. Yeah, 1080 image is crazy. Okay. So you can imagine that we have 49 neurons that each represent their own pixel and how activated that pixel is. Think of the activation as just a value between zero and one um, that just represents how, how dark or how bright that pixel is. So, okay, I see. Yeah. I see. so for example, for this, let's say this is an image of a five. All of these would be zero. And the only things that would be a one here and these pixels are these little lines that are being drawn. Um, okay. And there's gonna be some kind of process going on here with the hidden layers such that maybe we, we don't know how many hidden layers we have either. This is kind of something you can play around with, but there's gonna be some kind of a foot stretch that the, Every one of these outputs that we have is going to receive some numeric value that is a continuous value between zero and one. So it can be any value between zero and one. That's just going to represent how activated that neuron is. So in this example, let's say 0 0.8 has the highest activation. That means that in this multiple choice exam, our classifier thinks that this five is a two. And that's what it thinks. So that's what it's going to output. And it's just going to tell us it's a two. Does that make sense so far? All right. What okay. So yeah, sorry, say this is a four. Yeah, so to, to go with the example I have on the slide. Um, how, how does a neural network know what a four looks like? So this is a higher, it's, this, this, like, this, this image is like, I don't know, it's higher resolution than a seven times seven. I don't know the exact resolution, but it's higher. Pretty low. It is pretty low though. It is pretty low, obviously. It might be 64. Right? I, I, I can't remember, but yeah, this is a four. We know this is a four, but how can we recognize through this multi-layer neural network that this is a four? Notice that a four is really just a combination of this, which is this, this, which is this, and this, which is just the little bottom part. And notice that this is really just maybe splitting this in half and having this and this. And you can keep eating this splitting process until you get to, I don't know, let's say we're looking at a four, so we know a four. And let's say we're only looking at this part. So we're gonna have a neuron that's somewhere in this hidden layer that's responsible for things that look like that. So when it sees something that looks like this, or sorry, when it sees something that looks like this, it kind of looks like that. So maybe it'll give a 0 0.7. How's this What do you mean? Oh, no, I mean, um, this is just kind of like, ideally how we want this to work. So ideally, we want it to learn smaller representations of the four and try to keep learning smaller representations of the four until each neuron has its own responsibility. It has its thing that it's looking out for, like its job. In reality, it doesn't work like this. Um, the, image has, the images have a lot of noise. So a neuron might be looking at something that literally looks like, I don't know, an old TV that uh, doesn't have a channel or something. It, it, it might look like a total mess. That's not what I know about this. Like. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the best I can do. That is the best I can do for analog. Yeah. Me that you don't know how I have an image in my head. <laughs> I have an image in my head, but I cannot 
take that to, to, to the whiteboard. Yeah, 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 that is more of an implementation question. It depends on how many hidden layers you have. So it might be that that is, that is supposed to be a square. Oh, it might be that when you receive a, a seven, for example, that this neuron is looking for this. And it is only looking at this spot in the image. It doesn't care about what's going on in the rest of the image, which again is in practice, it's not true. But just for the simple example, just believe this is true. Uh, but if we have a six, like it's not going to see anything. It, so it'll have an activation zero. It might be looking at the same part of the image, or it might look at different parts of the image depending on the input. So, so if you're testing for whether it's a four or a seven or a five, whatever number, it, it always looks at kind of like the center where it was programmed to look. So what if the seven, what if it learns that a, a four is that, right? But then the four is off center. Well, it would still work. It would still work. It would still work. It would still work. Because you have lots of training examples, and we're not looking for a specific example of four. Okay. We're trying to learn what a four kind of looks like. So, given any four, we can identify that as a four. Because how you test this, you don't test this on the data that you train it on. You test it on a testing data set, which is totally new samples of fours, right? So, you have 10,000 fours. So, you kind of have one four that's in the center, you have one four that's off the center, you have a four that's maybe up here, very weirdly drawn. Okay. And you kind of get better at identifying each one, the more, the more data you have. That makes sense. Um, so we train this kind of network using gradient descent. So a few things to keep in mind. Learning is just finding the right weights and biases, biases for a network to work. I haven't mentioned um, biases up to this point. Imagine this as just another threshold for some neurons. So some neurons need, for example, a 10, otherwise they're negative. Let's say we have, a, we, we might have something like this, I1, W1 minus B, where B is equal to, where B is equal to 10. So I1 and W1 need to be greater than 10 until they're a positive value. Otherwise it's just gonna be a negative value. So this is kind of like a way of punishing uh, the inputs and the weights. Another value that you can play around with, another parameter. So we want to make an algorithm that is able to learn the correct weights and biases such that we converge on a solution, much like we did with the perceptron on learning rule. And like mentioned previously, we're going to train it on a training set. So imagine something like 10,000 images of handwritten digits that are labeled, and we're going to test it on a testing set. And the goal is a generalized multi-layer network that can classify any instance of a four that you throw at it. You can draw a four and it'll classify it. So we know that every neuron is connected to every other neuron in, its, in, the, in the layer that precedes it. So every neuron is kind of a combination of all the neurons that came before it and itself. You can think of this as like you're adding them all together. Um, Weights are how strong each connection are. We can penalize a connection or we can, um, what's, what's the opposite of penalize? Reward. reward. We can reward that input. And um, bias indicates whether the neuron is, tends to be positive or tends to be, or tends to be active or tends to be inactive. If it tends to be inactive, we're going to give it a really high bias, so like negative 1,000, and it'll very rarely be active. Um, Something to keep in mind and how we would write, um, we haven't mentioned it yet, but let's say we have some activation one. Activation one is really just the sum of the inputs times weights plus I2, W2. This just means however many up to IN, WN. Um, and then we subtract the bias. And all of this. We multiply times the activation function. That's the symbol for the sigmoid. Oh. So 
that is how you would view the formula for what we've already learned, which is the neural network. Um, you just have the sum of inputs to time of the weights minus the bias, and you multiply that by the activation function. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to initially put every weight equal to some random value. And with that random value, we expect terrible performance. So we're going to define a cost function. And the cost function is just the sum of squares of differences of intended output versus actual output. So in this example, the intended output is a four, because we're sending it a four. But the actual output is a two. So we have an error here. We have an error of two. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're going to square that two, so it's going to become a four. And we're going to do that for all of our training examples, and we're going to have our respective errors. So we're probably going to have a very high error. And this cost function is going to be very complicated because we have a lot going on, and it's not really easy to wrap your head around a function like this. But we don't need to because we can just say that it exists and our goal now becomes to minimize the value of the cost function because that means that we have the least amount of error okay does that make sense nice now how do we minimize a cost function you'll remember from calculus that you can find the minimum of a function by finding wherever the derivative the point where the derivative is equal to zero which means that the slope, right? We're just looking for the point where the slope is zero. So that would be this point. But this doesn't work for functions with a local minima. So something like this, we might find that the slope is zero here, but we don't care, we want this one. This still has a very high error, so we want this one. So this derivative idea doesn't always work. But we kind of have an idea of where to go because we know that we can step. Let's say we see that we start at this point and we see that the slope is downwards. So we know that we can go downwards. And then maybe calculate the slope here. And keep going down. And we can do that here as well. The slope is down, so we go down. Down. And we keep going down. So we keep calculating the derivative of this point until we get zero. Does that stepping idea make sense? At least the intuition for it. You really don't need to know the specifics, but it's just good to have the intuition that that's how we're trying to make this algorithm. Um, yeah, I think that if you can add on the, a little bit, um, the idea is that you, you start at any, any point, and at that point, you evaluate, okay, what's the quickest way I can go down? And then once you reach a point where you can't go down anymore, you can't go down anymore. Yeah. Just bring it up. Let's think about it another way. Imagine a bunch of balls are falling from the sky onto this valley. They could fall anywhere. So they, they could fall into here or they could fall into here. So those are the minima, right? And we want to find the lowest point of that minimum, right? So we can look at multivariate functions now. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so in, in multivariate calculus, we learn about the gradient, which is the partial derivative with respect to x, y, and z um, for some multivariate function. And the gradient gives us the direction of steepest increase. And what that means is that for this little diagram that we have here, if we calculate the gradient, let's say at this point, then it's going to tell us to go this way because it's the point of the greatest increase. Okay? Um, so we know which direction we need to go to go up the fastest so we can just go the negative of that direction and go towards the lowest point and that's the idea that is the generalized idea of the derivative because again this only works for single value functions so single variable whereas this one will work for multivariate functions so we have generalized the derivative solution to functions with more than one variable. I'm not going to assume that you know calculus calculus at all, but um, it's just good to know that you have this tool that can tell you which way to go up. So you know that you just go the other way that it tells you to go, right? That's what matters. Yeah.
Like a pair, yeah. I'm okay with the concept, just don't ask me to calculate it. No, it's fine. Yeah, at this point, and it'll still continue to be fun. You can always learn calculus later, yeah. Um, and so this is actually a vector, the gradient returns a vector, and we know how steep we're actually going because we know the length of that vector. So it actually tells us a lot of important information. Uh, moving on. We have arrived at an algorithm for minimizing the cost of our function. We just compute the gradient. We take a small step in the direction of negative gradient, so just the opposite direction that the gradient is telling us to go. And we repeat that until we reach a minimum. And we don't just do this for the four. So we can do this for four, but if we did it for the four, a lot of times, then every output would be a four. We need to do it for four, we need to do it for five, we need to do it for six, and so on. You need to do it for everything in your, in your sample size. And there's a lot of algorithms to do this efficiently. Like, for example, you might randomize the order of your data set. So let's say your data set is one, two, three, or one, two, three, one, two, three four, five, six. So you have all the samples for one, all the samples for two, all the samples for three. You might just do like three, five, six, four, two, one. And do this algorithm a bunch of times in this order or another order or some other way so you can minimize the amount of time that this is going to take. Because clearly it's not as easy as the perceptron convergence rule. Another thing that is just a requirement of things that you can uh, calculate the derivative of is that the function must be continuous and it must be smooth. It can't have any spiky points. It needs to be smooth and continuous, which we can guarantee, because if you remember earlier, with the sigmoid, we restricted the outputs to continuous values between zero and one. So we have a smooth function, it's continuous, so there's no problems, we can do this. Yeah, differentiable, so continuous is differentiable. Now, how do we apply this to all of the layers that we have? Remember, we've only applied this to this last layer. We want kind of to, this is a feed forward network, right? Outputs, outputs go out, but we want the error to go backwards because we want to reach every hidden layer and try to fix every hidden layer such that we get to a better, a better understanding. If you remember when I mentioned responsibility, I didn't mean responsibility just in the sense of being assigned to read one thing. I mean responsibility in the sense that this layer has some kind of weight. Um, it has some kind of weight that it's sending to, to two. So it has a certain amount of responsibility as to what this is going to be. So we want to make sure it's good. And another thing to consider is that some weights are more important than others. So since this is a four, let's say for a four, we're getting a 0 0.2. It's much more important for this four to go up. So let's say for this four, for the 0 0.2 to become a 0 0.8, then it is for this 0 0.2 to become a 0 0.1. So what you're trying to do here is create a network that is localized, not specialized. Is that way, one way to think of in terms of rural science? What does that mean? So it means that in terms of like brain structure, okay. right, there was a older models that said that particular parts of the framework is responsible for the one thing that's a specialized function but in reality all of our brain in some measure contributes to all kinds of processing this is true it's localizing and so all the neurons even though they're not directly responsible for like zero right they are still contributing in some way those that are output. connected yeah. not all of them just all the all those that are connected so, so all the ones that are connected like 0 0.7 and maybe whatever is here are matter here but maybe like this one is going here. Yeah, so remember that these are essentially functions. They can only have one connection. Right. You did mention earlier about the whole dendrite spiny connections thing. Uh, is that something that happens quote unquote organically in the system or is something that, like this? Yeah. In the brain? Yeah, no, not in the real brain, but the, the, the artificial kind of network. Or because you mentioned something about us not knowing how that actually works. Um, 
Sorry, can you that, was, that was further back when we were explaining the dendrites. That depends on the architecture you have. So I think for the simple models, the connections you you do, you define them. So you state that, uh, this layer, all of the neurons connect to all of the neurons in the next layer. But there's some more complicated systems that, um, as it learns the connections, so this this neuron and this neuron might be connected in one iteration, and then in the next one they're not connected. Those are uh, more dynamic architectures. I know Google has one for like different, using the same learning for different um, types of media outputs. So it could be for if you connect this neuron and this neuron, you'll get like a text answer. Okay. And then it can use the same type of learning and then disconnect these two and now it'll be like an image. Okay. Um, but those are more complicated. I think these are like static in that the connections are already pretty sure. Okay. All right. In a way, in a way, in a way. But these are feed-forward networks. Right. So this is characteristic of feed-forward networks. There's other types of networks, like I was mentioning, yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. All right. So looking in the back propagation, we don't just want to know the error here. We want to know the error everywhere else, like we just mentioned. And we want to know what is more important that we change. So like we mentioned, it's more important that this 0 0.2 becomes 0 0.8 than this 0 0.1 becoming 0, 0 0.0 or whatever. So we mentioned responsibility. We want to calculate the degree of responsibility of each hidden unit as respect to some output. So 0 0.7 is a lot more responsible than, let's say, for example, whatever this is, like 0 0.2. This uh, neuron right here is a lot more responsible to raising the lowering the 0 0.8 because we have a four than <laughs> this 0 0.2 is. This 0 0.2 is kind of irrelevant, honestly. So we care very little about it. I represent that with a little arrow, whereas there's a big arrow for 0 0.7. Okay. Um, and we're going to use the error value that we calculate to change the weights of the hidden units. We've already kind of talked about, no, it's just stuff we've already talked about. Like we, we mentioned that <laughs> outputs go this way and error goes this way. Nothing, nothing too complicated there. And that the total output is kind of the integral of the input from previous layers. I mean that in the sense of the sum. So it's the sum of all previous layers that are connected to that. That is gonna be what the activity that's transmitted to the other players. Okay. Yeah. Nothing too complicated there. We, like you already mentioned, some weights are more important than others, and we want to increase the weights of the neurons that are more important to have a correct output. So now we don't just want to change the weights. We don't just want to change the activations. We want to change the weights in proportion to the activation. So this is their responsibility. So we're going to change the weights that are very important by a lot, and we're going to change the weights that are not so important by a little bit. Same thing we're going to do with activation. The activation is going to change with the weight, right? So if there is a lot of activation, then the weight is going to change a lot. Since the weight changed a lot, the activation is going to change a lot. Kind of circular. And we're going to apply this process all the way down. So we start here, then we go to the next hidden layer, the next hidden layer, the next hidden layer, until we reach the input. And that is back propagation at a very high level for a single training example. Like I mentioned previously, you can't just do this for a single training example. You need to do this for all of your training examples. So for two, for five, for six, and so on. Some interesting results from backpropagation. Multi-layered networks can compute any Turing computable function, but it is not true that backpropagation will always converge on a solution. Um, and that's unlike the perceptron convergence rule for linearly separable functions that will always converge on a solution. So how biologically plausible is this? Not a lot, not, not at all. There's no evidence that this happens in the brain whatsoever. Um, and there's also things like, so we, we have hidden units here. 
So how does the brain determine how many hidden units it has? Well, there's some pretty complicated math for determining the, the amount of hidden units you have here, but we don't know how the brain does this. And there's also the matter of scale. Neurons have something like, there's like, uh, in small clusters of the brain, there's something like 200,000 neurons in a, just a very small place. Whereas the most advanced AI neural networks have like 5,000 neurons. So there's a matter of scale in that we don't have as many neurons as we need to actually be comparable at all to the brain. Um, and there's no real reason to believe that uh, biological learning follows from supervised learning. Local algorithms are a lot more plausible. So we can think about competitive networks. So these are networks that don't require any feedback and they don't allow every neuron to activate like you see here. They only allow a single neuron, the one that is most competitive. So the most activated neuron is the only one that will fire. So you have a bunch of layers. It's not gonna be like this where you have a bunch of different ones. Um, your, if this is 0 0.7, boom, it's done. Everything that's like this is 0 0.7 is gonna fire. That's very different from what we just discussed, but that is more biologically plausible. Um, and that's an example of heavy and learning as well. So, yeah, yes. Neural networks model information processing at the algorithmic level. What we mean by that is that, for example, the learning process is algorithmic. Um, the way we compute the weights and the biases is algorithmic, but the neural network itself, not, not really, especially multi-layer networks. They're not implementations of symbolic algorithms. So if we saw earlier with the single layer network, yeah, we can implement a knot with a single layer network and it's kind of symbolic in a way, but not with the multi-layer networks. It's a lot more complicated. It's really out of scale for us to imagine. Um, Neural networks are, what I just mentioned, they're algorithmic, but in a limited sense. Um, we have algorithms for update, updating their activation levels. Their learning rules are algorithmic, but they're not algorithmic in the same way that a Boolean function is algorithmic or any other kind of symbolic system. I'm sure Hilton could talk some more about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, what, what you want me to talk about? Oh, right. the, Have you finished? This is well, about, near, no, but yeah, I no. It's just if you wanted to mention something about symbolic systems and the difference between them and neural networks. Oh, okay. Well, the um, yeah, the, the the thing is that uh, uh, um, new, neural networks is uh, as as Diego just mentioned, uh, it exploits a, a kind of uh, parallel computing. While physical uh, 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 physical simple systems are more uh, serial, okay. So so you, if, if think of it as as um, as syntactic rules, you know, to construct a tree, okay. You you apply a, a rule to a symbol, and then after that you apply the next one, and then you apply the next one. So it's uh, it's, it's it's serial, okay. Uh, that that's not what's going on in neural networks, okay. So uh, um, this is this is all you know. Uh, uh, Distributed, you know, uh, parallel. So there's no uh, one neuron that that represents something in particular, uh, at least not in the in the uh, substance that Diego presented. You no, know? there there are some other versions that are more biological plausible. You know, that with with more locality in which uh, you know uh, it, it, it it has some of the properties of physical simple systems. But uh, but yeah, but pretty pretty much we can talk about that uh, you know after uh, another time. I don't I don't want to interrupt Diego. This is going very well. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh -huh, yeah. When we have when we have representations in neural networks, they're kind of all over the place. Like we previously mentioned, the idealized model for this neural network. When we're trying to learn a four, we maybe learn segments of the four in different place, and we save those all around across the neural network. It's not, nothing is, we, we don't have a, a neuron that's detecting a four anywhere. That, that's not a thing. We don't have an image of a four. If you, you can't ask a neural network what a four is. You can ask it to classify an image, and it'll let you know if, it's a, if it thinks it's a four, but if it has no concept of a four. 
four. Its knowledge lies in the pattern of weights and thresholds, which makes it kind of hard to interpret, especially for that reason. We can't ask it what a four is, it just kind of can classify the representation in a multiple choice exam kind of way. Um, but th that comes with an advantage because we don't need a separate unit to code for every feature which, um, which we're trying to find, right? We kind of have each neuron doing its own thing and we can determine the accuracy based on how it does compared to, to a testing data set. Does that make sense? I'm just thinking this, this, these networks are deterministic at the end, right? Like, okay. they're, they're like their patterns eventually determine what their output is. Yeah, there's nothing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really like the, the pattern of weights and input is going to determine what the output is. There's no actual representation of anything here. Like, if you trained it on images of a giraffe, it has no actual representation yeah. of a giraffe. Right. So this is kind of what, what we just mentioned. Um, we encode the knowledge, quote unquote, into sets of weights. Um, we have inputs and we have weights and we can't really think about the neural network having particular beliefs on anything that it's doing for the same reasons that we just discussed. And there's no clear distinction between uh, information storage and information processing, like Hilton mentioned, um, neural networks ex exploit parallel processing. They're not serialized. Um, so parallel processing is kind of the activation through the entire network. Knowledge is distributed across the network. Every Everything nowadays in terms of neural networks or machine learning is distributed. It's just a lot more efficient and it has much better performance. You're not gonna see discrete symbol structures for um, some kind of neural network model. And we don't need any explicit rules as that explain our neural network what to do. We don't actually tell it, hey, look at this part of an image for a four. We don't, we don't do that. We just kind of let it learn based on the rules that we previously defined and the algorithms we previously defined. Um, it basically learned by stimulus, right? And we tell it that's interesting. That's interesting, but no, because that would be something more like how the brain actually works. If you think about it, we because like Hilton, correct me if I'm wrong here, but Christopher just said that. Yeah, I did. I couldn't hear Christopher. I couldn't hear Christopher. So if you could repeat the question. Was a question, not a, not a statement. Yeah, Chris, Christopher asked. Christopher asked if um, neural networks kind of learned from stimulus. I I, I don't think so because I, I think that's more similar to how the brain actually works, or how sim or how uh, localized. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 okay, are we talking about artificial or 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 biological? Uh, artificial, 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 artificial. Oh well. Fernando is there, so I, I, I think he's, <laughs> he's probably, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, much more qualified than me to answer that. But, uh, but what, what do you mean by stimulus? What, what, what does it... Hello? Uh, I can't hear anything. Hello? Se quedaron en silencio, Se quedaron en silencio, ¿verdad? Tú tampoco oyes nada. No. Pero estaba, no. Yo, pero estabas oyendo hace un, hace un, hace un poquito. Sí. Sí. Antes okay. de que te preguntaran sobre el aprendizaje, es lo de los estímulos. Sí, pues yo no sé si ellos saben que no estamos oyendo. Eh, Hello. Sí. Ah, ah, sí, es que dejamos de Fernando y yo dejamos de oírlos completamente. Ahora nos escuchan. Ahora sí. Ok, ok. All right, all right. So my question, I'm defining stimulus very broadly. Oh, you got to hit full screen on the top right. No, not that one. No, that's no. The left. Yeah. All right. Uh, so 
my question was defining stimulus very broadly. You have a, a, a set of functions that are using to predetermine how weights are being processed, how, how the input's being processed to, uh, to get to the threshold. So I'm thinking, okay, so these numbers that you're giving an as a, putting together as an input to reach the <laughs> threshold or not, and then you're correcting things as you go, as it gives you the wrong or the right output, and you're, you may even reward it for doing the right thing or uh, penalize it for doing the wrong thing, um, then that's a core of kind of stimulus learning. It's just that you're stimulating it with, with just numbers. Right, but I don't know if that if, if stimulus is the incorrect characterization of that. So that's why I was asking. No, uh, broadly speaking, uh, stimulus is a correct name for that because if you look at the retina, for instance, uh, the Bones and the roads generate uh, some electrophysiological signals that mm -hmm. travel along the optical nerve all the way to the visual cortex. Right. So, depending on how strong the light is, uh, the stimulus is going to be larger, which also happens in artificial neural networks. And That's the fantastic. main difference is that the visual system and the, all our senses are highly nonlinear. So, uh, not like, uh, for instance, the perception of color in uh, environments that are dark is based in process. Right. But okay. you can see but that are clear or dark. And as you increase the level of light, you will be able at some point to detect the color of the image. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, so the... Uh, the input, uh, the input units in the in the network, um, yeah, you can say that receiving a stimulus that is, uh, 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 you know, analogous both in artificial and in uh, biological neural networks, you know, that uh, pretty much from, uh, you know, from 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 the data or from, yeah, from from the perception from the stimulus. Okay, right. I, I guess right. you could say that. What what is what what happens as far as I understand in in artificial neural networks that are is not um, uh, attested you know at least in in organic ones is the uh -huh. uh, the kind of initial and and please Fernando correct me if I'm wrong uh, kind of arbitrariness of the weights. You know, uh, for for the for the connections, when 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 you when you design when you design um, uh, an artificial network, uh, you have to assign weights to the different connections, okay? Uh, and that initial that initial assignment, okay, uh, is there? Is it pretty much like arbitrary, or yes. yeah? Yeah. So. Let's call it uh, random. Random, because random. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the word. elegant word. That is that. That's the word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, arbitrary is very charged. Okay, <laughs> so it's it's random. So uh, we we have no reason to 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 think that 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 randomness happens in 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 biological networks. Not right? at all. Not at all. Uh, the brain is not. Tabula, but 
Exactly. So perhaps there are some kind of, I don't want to say fixed weights, but probably fixed intervals. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, and I think that Diego mentioned it before that this is very simplified to what happens in the brain for several reasons. And, right. and one of them is the fact that uh, in, in artificial neural networks, all units have the same morphology pretty much, uh, but that's not the case in biological neurons. So by uh, right. biological, I, actually, the, I think the cortex alone has more than 12 kind of different neurons, okay? And you can have, you can have uh, uh, connection highways between uh, localized uh, 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 areas, processing areas in the brain that uh, involve different kind of neurons doing different kind of things, okay? And the absolute no, 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 as far as we know, in, bio, in, in biological networks is back propagation. There's no way that signals can go backwards in neurons, in real neurons. So, yeah. so that, that's why it's always said that artificial neural networks are inspired, you know, by, uh, by, by the uh, connectionism, be the connection between neurons in the, in the brain. But that's pretty much where the, the similarity starts and ends. Okay, uh, so but, but Nando is the expert here, so I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I, I feel like very um, um, <laughs> an imposter. <laughs> about this I, 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 just one comment, just one Kim comment, real quick. Yeah. What? Kim Jong Un's there, right? What? They had the vision, and inspired. On the natural neural network, mm. but the circuits in the brain are very intricate. They are right. not fit for one network. Mm -hmm. There is plenty of feedback in their brain. In addition, uh, and the architecture is not as regular multi-layer circuit and it is definitely not fully connected. One single neuron can connect up to 10,000 neurons. So okay. Not, so, it's not about fully connected because imagine a fully connected network with 10, 10 to 100 billion neurons that our central nervous system has. And that will be a huge number. Okay. Exactly. Um, and, uh, and there's uh -huh. another thing is that um, we have, uh, you know, uh, we, we have pretty solid evidence that at least not all representations in the, in the human mind, um, uh, 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 let me rephrase this. We have evidence that there are representations in the human mind that are not vectors, okay? That do not behave like vectors. So, uh, for example, uh, and one of the classic examples is what is called uh, imagistic representations. So that's, uh, for example, when you can, um, uh, you, when you can see a figure, we, you can see if imagine that uh, you can see a figure, okay, uh, or two figures, and you have to, you have to determine whether both figures are different views of the same object, okay. Uh, but they're uh, kind of rotated, okay? So, uh -huh. uh, so, so we can do that. People can do that. Most, most people will do it kind of Im Im imag imagistically, okay? So it's like you kind of have like a, like a, like a, almost like a picture, okay, of that object in the mind, and then you mentally rot rotate it to see if it matches the, the, uh -huh. the, the second picture, okay? And, uh, and the fact that we know that those representations are not vectorial is that when you represent them as vectors, uh, to, to compute 
if both uh, images represent the same object rotated, uh, it will actually be the same complexity in calculation. So it doesn't mind. It doesn't matter if it's rotated just a little bit, just just uh, uh, I mean, just five degrees okay, in one in one dimension, or if it's rotated in the three dimensions. Okay, uh, the, the the calculation is the same. The complexity is the same. The processing time is the same. Okay, humans do that very differently. Okay, and the time that you that it takes for a person to for a human being to realize or to determine if both uh, images correspond to the same figure. Uh, it actually depends on the angle of rotation. So it's like as if you were moving. Okay, if you have if you have to move it just a little bit, it takes less time. If you have to move it more, it will take more time. So and that's exactly how we process it. So so uh, uh, visual things, it seems that we represent them, re represent them imagistically, as if they were the objects in the brain. Okay, so it's uh, we don't really know exactly how that happens, but the fact you know the the the, um, uh, the time correlation between processing and 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 uh, and rotation, uh, it, it seems that it's not vectorial. I mean, it has to be some other kind of representation. So um, so it's still uh, still you know that doesn't mean that. Uh, that there's only one kind of representation in the human mind. There may be more than one, but there should be good justification for that. You know, Occam's Occam's razor. Okay, uh, you don't want to have more than two, more than one thing if you don't need them. So, uh, but but it's uh, but but definitely it's uh, it's uh, um, uh, and that's another thing is that you, uh, they're they're localized. They're very localized uh, in in the brain. They're localized uh, groups of neurons within the same network, which actually I don't think you can mimic that in in the neural networks that that at least the ones that Diego were described. I think there are other models in which there are more localized uh, uh, connections. Uh, Fernando, if do am, am I right? But but yes, but still I haven't seen anything that. Uh, resembles uh, the actual circuits in the brain. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I was starting a research a long time ago about chaos because it seems that human uh, memory, you say, Strange attractors. Attractors. Mm -hmm. For okay. the representation of memory. But that's way too complicated mm -hmm. at this point. <laughs> that that's I the wonder... next chapter in my cognitive science class. <laughs> so that, yeah. because there, those are the, the non the non-representational uh, uh, models of the human mind. Yeah, neural networks and and dynamic and dynamic systems. Yeah, different from the physical symbol system, which is like the classical, you know, the the, the classical model for the human mind. Okay, let's Diego continue. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he was doing very well. Diego, I don't um, know if you are, are you done or no? You uh, there's, a, there's two more slides, I think. Yeah, some people are. So okay, well, we have we have ten. Perdóneme. ¿Dónde estás poniendo los videos? No, todavía no los he puesto porque eh, tan pronto tengamos, tan pronto tengamos un, un canal de YouTube o algo así, los, los, los y tengo que pedirle permiso también a los a los conferenciantes. Entonces, que los tengo todavía todos, no, no pero los voy a poner en el drive. Lo voy a poner en el drive, pero eh, creo que hay unos que no están en el drive todavía. Mira, ¿y, la, y lo de e-course ya está o todavía? Todavía, pero este fin de semana, an antes, de, antes de que empiece el lunes. ¿Y cuándo tú regresas? No te escuché, perdóname, regreso el sábado. El sábado. ¿Y el te sábado. vas de nuevo? 
¿Te vale nuevo? En marzo. Marzo. ¿Marzo qué? 21. Ma es un martes. Okay. Ok, está bien. No, es para saber. Por si acaso estás aquí cuando todavía está la gente de la compañía. Ok. okay. Pues vamos, vamos a dejar que Diego termine. Porque ya hay sí. gente que se está guiando. Ok. And it's pretty much just stuff we've already covered. Uh, it's hard for the models that we've just described. To model for or sorry, the, the physical systems, right? Rule-based models, it's hard for them to model things like language as we we know very well. Um, for example, ambiguity. It's very hard for rule-based models to model ambiguity. Um, and there's many other examples of things that things that they very, very much struggle in modeling. And connectionist networks, they're very good at classification tasks, like we just discussed, because it doesn't really matter how correct they are. They only have one output. So even if even if they, they just have a 70% confidence that something is a four, if that's the highest confidence, that's good enough if it's actually a four. That makes them very that makes them very good for, for these kinds of tasks. Um, so aside from this reference, I highly recommend these videos by 3Blue1Brown on basics of neural networks, gradient descent, and backpropagation. He explains it a lot better than I do. And he also goes into more of the calculus behind stuff as well, which is always good to know. So that's all. Thank you. All right. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah, okay. Diego. Did you do? Did is it is this the presentation that you uh, uh, that you gave to my to my students? Okay. 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 I have like one last like lingering question before we go. We have seven minutes. Just thinking about the whole uh, uh, how. You know how analogous artificial and biological new, uh, networks are, neural networks are. Uh, I was just thinking maybe some of the knowledge that's passed down uh, and coded in the DNA is kind of translated in terms of like uh, fresh. Uh, oh, yeah, could you? Could, uh, they're asking to why? Why are we stopping the recording? Oh, oh, okay, so okay. Uh, so Anaya is asking if we should stop the recording since the presentation is over. Oh, okay. Uh, so I thought we were, we were in the Q and A, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I thought so too. But well, let's finish, let's finish the Q and A and then after. So, anyways, uh, we were looking at analogous patterns and that, and I was thinking, for instance, monarch butterflies travel over multiple generations. They die, and the, their offspring keep going in the same direction on and on and on. And one of the famous quoted studies, I was thinking maybe some of that. Then that information is passed down via DNA and DNA is setting, you know, threshold weights for the thresholds. And maybe that's how that knowledge is passed down. You know, just thinking in terms of mixing the terminologies here, I would love to talk to a neurologist about this uh, or neural yeah, scientist. The, the, yeah, the, the thing is, and the, the difficulty of that is what exactly is the knowledge that they have? What do they know? Okay. Yeah. Uh, do, what do, do, do they, they know? know geography? <laughs> okay. Do they know? Do it, are they passing information about geography? About they passing I information about, or 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 is it? Um, or do they direction. have some kind of other sensorial systems like the magnetic, like like magnetic fields? Okay. Uh, or 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 orientation by by uh, by the stars? You know that we so, so it's. It's difficult. We don't. We still do not know for sure what kind of information it is. So even less, you know, how is it encoded? Because we don't know what what's the information that they're that they're uh, manipulating. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's, I think it's a dangerous proposition to think about this because then we start veering into how deterministic 
our our minds are <laughs> from birth. Well, right? it's, I mean, it's not it's it's not dangerous. I think it's fascinating, but uh, um, it's fascinating. But yeah, but like, but yeah, it's it's like well, it's it's the same. It's it's actually the same theory be, behind behind uh, human language. Okay, uh, we we know that there's something that is happening that that is. Uh, passing from generation to to generation, okay. Uh, that yeah. language language acquisition is not tabula rasa, so it, it doesn't start from uh -huh. zero. Uh, we we know that, okay. But what is exactly the, the kind of information that is genetically, I don't want to say genetically encoded, but it's that, but somehow, okay. It, I, I'm I'm being very oversimplistic here. Uh, so so we don't know. Okay, to know that is to know what universal grammar is and how it's encoded. We don't know that. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the um, yeah. uh, uh, actually, uh, what and and this is this is what ha what's happening in the minimalist program is that since this has to be genetically encoded somehow, it has to be the the, the simplest system. Okay, it cannot be like a complex uh, you know set of uh, a thousand phrase structure rules uh, as as Fernando uh, you know had to deal with. Uh, when 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 he was uh, programming that way, so it cannot be like that. It cannot be like that, it, especially because language kind of uh, emerge very late in the species, probably between fifty thousand and a hundred thousand years ago. So it, it must have been like a like a small mutation. So you cannot have a small mutation that encodes a thousand codes. <laughs> so that that's. Uh -huh. You know that's uh, that's kind of ridiculous. Okay, so to think of the universal grammar as that, it would be you know uh, totally ridiculous. Okay, so uh, it must be some little thing that you know uh, uh, that give a way to another to 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 a lot of other things, and that's uh, that's what Chomsky and other people propose. It's recursion. Okay, you only need you know recursion only need one thing, one thing in order to to be able to make infinite number of structures. So uh, and, and a recursive merge. That's why that, that you know that's, that's that's the thesis. One of the thesis in minimalism. So um, so 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 there's there are a lot of mysteries yet. Okay, in terms of what is the type of knowledge that modern butterflies have, or or uh, or human babies have. Okay, and then and how is encoded genetically and how is expressed. Okay, because one thing is to have. Uh, genes are not that deterministic because you can have something, you know, uh, your, your genes encode something, okay? Mm -hmm. But then those genes may express or may not express, okay? So, so, uh, uh, so, so that, that's, a, that's, that's, a, uh, that's another thing, you know, uh, 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 what happens in development, okay? So, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so it's um it, it's it's pretty complicated, and but it requires like a lot of uh, work together between biologists and and and. But and we're we're getting into the into the complicated nature of the interaction of nature and nurture, the, the long debate in multiple fields over centuries, and I think it, it's a fascinating thesis one the minimal the minimalistic approach to viewing yeah. language genesis, but also the idea of. Uh, just how much of uh, of a gene is expressed uh, via a, 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 you know nurturing stimuli, you know, or it's just the existence of it something that is uh, constraining, and to what extent, right? So it's it's really interesting, and, and yeah. I, I would love to, yeah, I would love to like continue talking about this for hours if I could, but yes, when I say media, so we have to. Uh, wrap it up. Well, I don't know if anyone wants to say uh, the last words. Christopher, just take some simulations that they've done on very elementary agents in what is called artificial life. So you get very elementary agents that as population behave in certain ways, like the uh, monarchal butterflies, that mm -hmm. they all travel in flocks in a certain direction, that one living for some reason follows, but yeah. the rest of the flock is just 
Fantastic. All right. Thank you. All right. So I think this wraps it up for today. Um, I will see everyone uh, next next week. Right. We can just keep keep in touch uh, uh, via our chat groups. What time is for you, Shinzo?